Welcome to Catching You Up with Nadav. Today, we have a very special guest. A lot of people wonder how some of these podcast producers get into the jobs that they get into. A lot of people think that they just went to some Google class and were pickpocketed by some of your favorite podcasters, but that's never the case. It's always something that they've been working for years. And uh, today, I have Nick Davis on, who produces this past weekend for Theo Vaughn. And before we get into introducing Nick, uh, I would like to thank the executive producer of this episode, the one and only Mr. Christopher Hart. Without Christopher Hart's big baller support, I'd probably be going to war-torn countries that the U.S. has a military presence in. And once some battle's done, I'll be up picking up all the unused AK-47s and unspent shells, that's what people call them, and swords of magazines and grenades that haven't gone off yet, and then just sell them to the... <laughs> <laughs> to the militants in the region. And then that creates a problem for the U.S. about 10, 15 years down the line. But thanks to Christopher Hart's big baller support, I don't have to be an accomplice to war crimes. And if you'd like to become a big baller supporter of the show, you can go ahead and click the Patreon link in the description below. Now's a good time to remind you to comment, like, and subscribe. It all helps the algorithm. And without further ado, welcome to Catching You Up with Nadav. And I'd like to introduce my guest, Nick Davis. Nick, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. This is awesome studio space you got here. It's always the producers that are impressed with this. It's, yeah, yeah. It's everyone else is just like, oh, so this is what it looks like, huh? It's like, no, no, no. This is fucking top tier. Which, uh, which reminds me, if you're looking to record a podcast in the Austin in the Austin area, uh, go to uh, SoundshedAV.com and book an appointment today. Sorry, I had to get that out. Yeah, this is kind of like the first time that, you know, we've kind of ex like DM'd back and forth on a couple things where it's, hey, man, how do you do this? Or, hey, how'd you get that guest? Mm -hmm. or, hey, can you connect me with so-and-so? But this is the first time that we're actually like talking in person for the most part and kind of just uh, uh, able to have an actual conversation. So I'm kind of excited to get to know you a little better. Me too. Uh, you're a legend of the game. Oh, one, thanks, one of the man. most uh, endearing laughs oh, uh, in podcasting. It. So. <laughs> Uh, happy to finally sit down. Hell yeah, dude. It's, uh, so yeah, I'll tell you a little bit on, on how this is going to work for people that have seen previous episodes of me interviewing other producers. Uh, we know where you're at now, but we don't know how you got there. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start at the beginning and just kind of figure out how you got to having one of the jobs that probably everyone envies in the world. Right on. So... When did this all start? Like, did you always know you wanted to do something in entertainment? Was it like, like, what was the first inception? Like, what was step one? Step, getting, you know, step like one, which I think most people are at this uh, spot, uh, was listening to podcasts. Uh -huh. Basically, I've been listening since like, I don't know, like 2007, like the early Bill Simmons ones, okay. uh, ESPN 06010, like fancy baseball. And this is like around when I'm in college. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I was an econ major. I, I like numbers, but like really was afraid of a whole nine to five thing uh -huh. and just kind of not really doing stuff. And then I started playing online poker full time, uh, which I <laughs> Fuck yeah, yeah, yeah. did not know that. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I, I, it was honestly a little addicted, but also winning. So, like, in nine months, I made, like... Oh, four... addicted to winning. Must be nice. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know the grind. You get there, and I play tournaments, so you're playing, like, oh, 11 yeah. hours a day. It's endurance shit. It's 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 honestly really toxic. Yeah. Sitting in a chair for that long is the hardest work you could probably do in the world. But you're listening <laughs> to a lot of podcasts at that time, and I made, like, $40,000 in nine months. Woo! But I basically dropped out of school like with a half a semester left or a semester left uh and didn't fill my credits and then uh what's known in the poker circles as black friday happened oh. and you just it was like uh it was like march 2011 and you just logged in and all the poker sites were shut down you couldn't access your funds and you could not play online poker and i had dropped out of school i did not have a job and I didn't know what I was going to do. Holy <laughs> shit. Let's take a quick break from the show and thank the sponsor of this episode, my bookie. Whether you're a first time better or seasoned pro, you can bet with confidence with my bookie. With promos like weekly risk-free boosts, you've got nothing to lose. 
bet on football, baseball, soccer, horse racing, or play a bunch of fun casino games. Whatever you're into, my bookie has it for the most part, if you could bet on it. With the holidays coming up, for sure, someone's going to be like, oh, let's put the big game on. And maybe you're not into that game. But you know what's going to make you into that game? Put a little wager on it. You're going to get a lot more excited about it. At least that's what I do to keep things interesting. Whether it be a $5 bet, a $100 bet, I know exactly what I'm rooting for and why. And it's to cover the spread. When you're ready to get started, just click the link in the show notes, sign up, and you're ready to bet. Use promo code Nadav to double your bankroll with 100% deposit bonus right away. You heard that right. 100% deposit bonus up to $1,000 with code Nadav, N-A-D-A-V, before you even place a bet. And if you've been betting with my bookie already, it's time to check out my bookie plus their new loyalty rewards program that helps you earn extra cash for doing what you already do. Bet anything, anytime, from anywhere with my bookie and use code word in a dove. Let's get back to the show. Then I got a job at Sports Authority. And basically at this point, I was like, I'm kind of fucked. What do I do? What do I like? I like sports and I like comedy. I'm just going to try to go towards those two things. So I got a part-time job at Sports Authority. I got a part-time job at Acme Comedy Club okay. in Minneapolis. I worked there for a year as a doorman. I actually worked at Rick Bronson's House of Comedy in uh, Bloomington for like two weeks. Okay. In those two weeks, I saw Jay Larson and Sebastian Maniscalco. Okay. It, it was a credible lineup I, for uh, this this is a club in Mall of America. And uh, so I just stayed around com uh, comedy there. I was listening to podcasts. Then from Sports 30, I got some job working for a guy who was like, he started his own brand of mixed martial arts equipment. He was just importing stuff overseas, like white labeling it and then like selling it on his own. Okay. He crushed it with like hand wraps and stuff. This is also when I really got into MMA, really because of the job. Like I wanted to like know more about the sport, but then I just like fell in love with it. And half my day was shipping, and I would just listen to podcasts at that time. Mm -hmm. And I worked for this guy for about a year and a half. I was his first employee. When he left, he had like four employees, and I was kind of managing them. But I was like, it was pretty early on in his business. I was like, I love like some type of a little bit of percentage, like something, just something where I felt like I'm working towards something instead right. of just clocking in. That's kind of always what I wanted. Just like something where I'm growing Being it. Being rewarded for working. Yeah, on. yeah. You see, the more you put in, the more you see you get out instead of just like showing up and getting a paycheck every day. He didn't really want to do that. So like really on a whim, I quit my job, moved in my Jetta TDI that had 300,000 miles and moved out. I got a gym membership and I moved out to LA and just planning to live in my car until I found a job in podcasting. Fuck, dude. And, and What year was that? 2014. Okay. And uh, before I left, I was like emailing and I, some of these emails I have and I really like looking back at them, but I was like emailing like Podcast One and some of the podcast networks trying to do ad sales because that I did like account management also for the Mixed Martial Arts equipment, equi uh, Company. So I thought I could like backdoor my way in like sales and then try to get into creative. Um, never really heard back from any of those. When I was living in my car, I interviewed at Oxford Road uh, uh -huh. and who is a giant, now one of the biggest uh, ad agencies. They just uh, merged with someone uh, like ad results or so someone they merged right. with. And now they're like the biggest podcast ad agency. Did it again. None of that really panned out. But my one of my favorite shows at the time was the Adam Carolla show. I was listening to that every day. Okay. And then I it was maybe I got here in October 2014. Didn't really find anything. Almost around Christmas, I was I was like feeling pretty down. I was like, what did I do? Feeling kind of lonely. Wish almost moved back. But my job, uh, my boss at the time, before I moved out here, someone I knew I could get this job that was $15 under the table. And it was actually a really dope job. It's called Matt Men. And they do layout on production sets. Okay. So, like, we'd be the first people in if they were shooting a business or someone's home. And we just, like, wrap the walls and put put uh, carp carpeting down. Basically, an insurance. So, if the production fucks up the house, it's on it's on Matt Men. But it was an awesome job. Got to go to, like, all these commercial sets. I was on two different sets with Vince Vaughn, uh, True Detective, and, and uh, some movie he did with uh, – the Franco kid, Dave Franco. No oh. one ever saw it, but uh, cool. <laughs> um, and then uh, 
was working that, almost moved back around the holidays, but my boss convinced me to stay and I stayed. And then like, I think it was like May of that year, Adam Carolla show said they were looking for an intern and like, I sent emails to like everybody on the staff with like some little knowing thing. And then I got that internship was Ubering full time as I worked. So here, hold on. <laughs> I want to know a little bit more about that mm -hmm. because a lot of people, they wonder like, who did you know? What type of nepotism is this that you did it? And for the most part, it's just like, no, no, no. This is like you, you find something and you're like, in your head, you tell yourself, I'm going to get this. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be so fucking annoying about it that there's no way that I'm going to get swept under the rug. They're going to know that I'm applying, mm -hmm. and then they're going to have to be forced into a decision whether to hire me or not. So you so you saw the you saw the you that they were looking for an intern. What did you do? Who did you email? Like, how did you find these emails? Like, tell me your process. I mean, just like, uh, like your mom's house, like people, you listen, you know the staff. So there's... All of those people in the background, but I knew theirs. I, I would like tweet at them. Like, it's like kind of, you ever like back in the day, people would send in resumes, and it would like someone would send in like a I don't know like a pizza box, and it, all the toppings would be like the things they do, and it was just something that stuck out. Uh -huh. Every like interaction, I just tried to say something where it was like tipping the cap that I knew also personally about something they did, not just about the show. It was like, oh, I know what you guys like. Cause like a couple of the behind the scenes guys had a podcast and like, it was like a Kanye reference to Gary Smith and Matt Fondelier, uh, to Gina, who's the news girl, Gina grad, uh, said something about, I'd make sure she was stocked up on diet Cokes. Cause I heard her complain about, <laughs> uh, not having Cokes in the studio. Um, just shit like that. I, I don't know. And like you said, be an, you said like be annoying enough. You want to make sure they see you, but then also you don't want to like right. turn them off. So like, yeah, no implication that you're annoying to be around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You you, you want to give off that you're persistent, not that you suck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ab absolutely. And I I think I rode that line pretty well. And then when I when I interviewed, uh, it had really helped that I had interviewed at Oxford Road. So the stuff you don't get is definitely going to help you as well. Like mm -hmm. just being able to say that I interviewed with this ad agency that they had worked for, let them know that like I knew a little bit more about it. And it wasn't, I wasn't just some super fan trying to get this job. Like I wanted to work in the industry and like understand the industry. So I think that helped a lot. And uh, yeah, they hired me. So, okay. So they hired you as an intern. What kind of duties did they give you? So it was specifically to clean up this mess of uh, two giant crowdfunding projects. Uh -huh. Adam Carolla did one to fund his independent movie Road Hard and one to fight patent trolls. Do you remember that when uh, a, a patent troll su oh, right. sued Mark Marin? they sued Adam Carolla, they said they had a patent on podcasting essentially right. serialized podcast where if, if it's an online radio in a serialized format they had a patent on yeah it. something insane yeah and for those who don't know patent trolls are literally just companies that try to find patents buy them hold on to them and then when they see it out in the world they'll sue them and it's that it's essentially extortion right and totally. and um most people end up settling because it's less pain of the ass but like Adam did this huge campaign where we're not going to settle. We're going to fight the trolls. And he, he, I think he raised like a million dollars uh, to fight the patent trolls. And, but with these uh, crowdfunding projects, they all had gifts. Uh, minimum, everybody got a t shirt. Okay. Other than that, there was like books with the movie, uh, visits to the office. And so making sure that everything that you guys promised is getting handled and taken care of. Yeah, the fulfillment essentially. But it had already started and I don't know what happened. Basically all the shirts got just sent out regardless of size to everyone. So there's five what are there's there's small through double XL. So you have one in six chance of getting the right shirt. Oh so eighty six percent of the people had the wrong shit, and I just eighty six. I, I just say I, I just say, <laughs> I just had to email all of these people, and there, there was, goes the defense fund. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, just in shipping costs. Uh, but there were it was uh, 
thousands and thousands of emails and they thought they would this would take me like the duration of my thing and i i sat down I, a lot of customer service what i did at the mixed martial arts company i made templates for every specific issue that someone could have mm -hmm. and i knocked it out in like i don't know a week or something just okay. i was i would i did not sleep i just answered these customer service emails and that impressed them and then they hired me for a very small amount of money <laughs> And you fucking took it because you were excited. And, and, and that's the biggest thing that I really want to emphasize to people that like there's so many times over the last decade where I've put out calls like, hey, we're hiring for this position or we're hiring for this position or we're looking for someone that does this kind of stuff. So many people email with shit that's just like, this is how you apply for a job. <laughs> like... You didn't like it, it's I asked for a resume mm -hmm. and I asked for some samples of work. You apply none of it and then just in the body insult something insulting. It's <laughs> like where it's like you're it, not even like an insult. I'd say it's more like a rib that you tell to a friend. I don't fucking know you. Yeah. <laughs> so to me, it just, you just sound like an asshole. <laughs> that, was, that was definitely a thing uh, on like King and the Sting because mm -hmm. like it was the show was like Brandon and Theo roasting each other, mm -hmm. but that emboldens the people. And, sure does. And some people just don't have the tact. Sometimes people can be funny, but a lot of times it does come off as like, oh, we right. don't really know each other. Like we just started like a behind the scenes show for Gold Hour called After Hour. It's like me, Chin, and a couple of the other behind the uh -huh. scenes guys. And we were talking about how there were some mean comments and I was like, oh, we should look at them on air. And then in post, I put a comment about me that said, uh, that guy Nick is such a pain face fucking douche. No, uh, <laughs> that guy Nick is such an overconfident pain fake fuck, pain face fucking douchebag. I don't know. That comment just absolutely destroyed me. <laughs> and and I'm just like elated on here. I'm like, we should look at him. And then underneath is that comment. <laughs> Dude, it's it's never a good idea to go in the comments. <laughs> I've said before on this show, the only reason that anyone should go in the comment section, first of all, if you're host or talent. Don't fucking go in there. If you're a producer, <laughs> go in there to figure out what the general consensus is. Because the only time that you could take a granular comment, and I'm shooting myself in the foot again here by explaining this, <laughs> but if they say that something is technically wrong, like the sound is off or fucking I'm seeing some black frames here and here, <laughs> you're like, so now I have this one fucking guy on every fucking episode that just says Nadav audio's off by like a couple frames. <laughs> and I'm like, I know it's not. And I know what you're doing. And God bless you, because now he also donates when he does it, which is kind of <laughs> cool. You were going in there to look for me comments, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and you fucking. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get, I get it. it. A lot of them are accurate, the mean ones. Uh, there's some nice ones, too. You can't get too high, can't get too low. Right, right, right. That's the thing. It's the hardest thing, too, is that, like, if you're, uh, uh, if you let the, the mean comments bother you, you have to also be like, well, look, if you're cool with accepting one random mean comment, you have to let mm -hmm. a random good comment fucking affect you in yeah. the opposite way. And it just never works. <laughs> <laughs> it just never works that way. But all right. Rewind. So you you are you are crushing this internship. You're getting this work done in, in a super speedy amount of time. What happens when they realize like, oh, shit, this guy's fucking like cut from good cloth. He's good fabric. What happens then? Uh, so just like three months in, uh, was this a I, set like duration internship? Yeah, it, it was always going to be three months. Okay. Um, uh, basically the summer. Oh, also for this job, the internship, they had just went through an issue where like, cause for internships in California unpaid, it's gotta be for credit or it's not allowed or I don't know. There's a lot of laws and it's gotten stricter in the last decade or so in California for, uh, f internships. Uh, so they were like, we need you to be enrolled in school. And I was not enrolled in school. So I enrolled in Pasadena City College. I was technically a Pasadena City College Tiger uh, for Fuck yeah. whatever amount of time. You paid like 50 bucks for like one class or something. Uh, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it was, it was like importing, exporting. It was like Vandalay Industries. I was learning about <laughs> uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that was my one class. That <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I had to do that. Honestly, the, the transition from intern to getting the job, I don't really remember that well, how the conversation went down, but it was kind of like, okay, you're willing to work. Like the doozies are scattered. It's very Lord of the Flies esque, uh, okay. at, at, at the Adam Carolla show in terms of duties and stuff, people just kind of figure it out. Right. And if you're willing to 
do it yourself. Like like they had a TriCaster with three remote cameras in there, a beautiful setup, uh, and it was just not being used. So I started filming and putting out clips pretty early in like 2015, 2016, like Instagram, I remember like Instagram transitioned to no video to 10 second video to one minute video, like right around that 2015 to 2017 time. Uh -huh. And so I, I put out some clips that did well and stuff. And I was just finding ways to, I don't know, do what I wanted to see out of a podcast essentially. Right. When, when your internship was getting close to the three month mark, mm -hmm. was it them approaching you? Hey man, are you trying to stay? Or was it you like, Hey, my internship's coming up uh, pretty soon. Like what the, can we can we continue this? Like, how did that conversation go? Yeah, I think it was more that it was obvious that I wanted to stay the whole time. And then I think they just offered it to me towards the end. But it was it was like no money. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it. You're untested. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. When yeah. you go from internship to pay, like, it's just. But that's the thing is that you're going from, like, school credit or and no fucking money, most likely, mm -hmm. to now, like barely enough money to survive with a roommate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Living room, 400, right. 450 bucks a month, mm -hmm. four years, Hollywood. Love that place. God <laughs> damn, dude. Uh, it, was, it was actually a really nice setup. It was like blocked off by a curtain. It felt like a room. It was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a really nice cloth partition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, no knock, dude. If it's stupid and it works, it's not stupid. And it was like 350 square feet, that, the living room. It was, it was not bad. It was not Can't bad. Can't afford to. Is it still available? Uh, <laughs> they, they, no, actually, uh, uh, house got knocked down maybe a couple of years ago. No, fuck. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, so wait, so you're at you're working with Corolla for three years? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh or no, uh yeah, about about three it's, it was like 2015, 2017. I guess two. I guess two. Damn, interesting. Okay. So you because I started getting in the podcast game 20 very early 2016. So you you're fucking you got a, you got a full year on me, man. <laughs> June 2015. It was it's when I started. Yeah. Damn. It, it's so crazy that everyone that I talk to all kindly roughly started around the same time mm -hmm. from each other, which is crazy to me. Yeah, that was like that was right before the boom. I, like I feel like 2015 to 2019. Maybe 2016, 2019, a little later, but like all the two person pods started popping oh, up. Right. Like all the super podcasts where yeah. it was like every, I feel like every comedian was like, oh, I need a podcast. And then uh, I don't know if Two Bears was the first one to do it, but it King was like. King of the Stingless. King of the Stingless. <laughs> 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 so that's it. You know what? And I'm totally down. King of the King, star King of the Sting started. The beginning of Super Podcast, mm -hmm. which was like, hey, this comedian's pretty good. This comedian's pretty good. But when you put them together, it's now like a fucking super group. Of yeah. Like, oh, shit, fucking Paul McCartney and fucking, I don't know, Garth Brooks, <laughs> maybe not a good one. But like, whatever, <laughs> like it's uh, uh, you just start seeing like, oh, this is now a possibility. Mm -hmm. And you start building on top of that. And I think people, the all the comedians that like had platforms, most of them didn't want to do it because they were like, I don't want to split the money. But then I was, King of the Sting, they took the leap and they saw that the whole was greater than the sum of the parts and they were making the money doubled as well. So like right. it, it made sense. And then it was like, then it was like we were on top and then two bears and then, and then bad Fred's. Oh came. yeah. <laughs> like, Here, then, hold on, hold on. All right. It's uh, cause I still want to get yeah, yeah, to yeah, like, yeah. Cause, cause we will, we will <laughs> get into that. Cause it, it's been crazy <laughs> to see just people switching spots. So you are uh, now at Corolla for about two-ish years. Mm -hmm. What happens or, like, like what is the transition from leaving there and going on to the next gig, and what is it? Yeah, so um, I, met, I met Theo at the Adam Corolla show, okay. and just uh, every time you just he just killed. Around, like, t that time, he just started doing the circuit and, like, just being undeniable, just going on shows and just being so fucking funny. Right. And... Uh, he came on Adam a couple time. I also produced Joe Coy's podcast there because he was just like had a podcast on podcast one. So we were just like the essentially session producers, but then we like became part of his show as well. Interesting. And uh, so Theo came on that. It was really funny and just got to know him. And I think he just kind of noticed that I was always like keeping busy and like doing something. And then he had a podcast at that time called Allegedly with uh, Matthew Cole Weiss. And they... Uh, they had like a little bit of traction and he was just like, oh, we'd love some social media help. And I was basically just cutting because uh, it was audio only 
cutting audio clips and putting some video visual aspect to them and putting those clips. Mm-hmm. Did that for a couple Someone months. Someone playing COD on top of their phone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish Someone I, cutting Play-Doh with a knife or something. <laughs> I wish it would have been ahead of that. I, 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 it's so, that's so funny uh, that, how much you see that all the time. Dude, but, it, it's so mm-hmm. many times you find shit where you're just like, yeah, this is the thing that works. Yeah. Jesus Christ, I put so much polish on this fucking thing that it's not even getting. <laughs> but I'll do it. I'll, uh, I'll put some Fortnite B-roll. But um, uh, what was I saying? So you were, uh, uh, they saw how hard you were working that you were keeping busy. Oh, yeah. And then, so Adam, or Theo, did some side work for him, just like those social clips. Went well. But then he was just like, oh, our podcast not not making money. Like, appreciate the help. But like, uh, and I was like, no problem. It was like a couple hundred extra dollars. And then uh, I got let go of the Adam Carolla show because of a a tiff with his mechanic. Uh, I kind of blacked out. And uh, me and this guy always had beef. And then I blacked out. Car mechanic? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Uh Adam Carolla has a car shop. And he Uh goes to Laguna Seca every year Uh uh, up in Monterey. Oh, yeah, I know where that is. Yeah, to Car Week, uh, Vintage Car Week. And he he goes up there and races. And I got to go on this trip, which was like a big deal. That was the the only dark week for Adam Carolla's Car Week up in Monterey. Interesting. And I got to go up there, and I had a booth where he had had done a documentary about Paul Newman's racing career, and I had like a booth there, and I was like selling the DVDs and merch and shit. And uh, so I was super like honored that I got to ask. And then uh, I was also doing a a keto diet at that time. We were in a weight loss competition uh, for a Tommy John ad spot. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, we, and uh so i was drinking whiskey we were at the acura like end of year party i was like drunk and talking like the cfo of acura and stuff <laughs> no, luck, luckily nothing bad happened there kept it pretty under control but then back at the airbnb i don't know i got an argument with this guy and uh he kind of we kind of wanted me fired and he uh made like 200 grand and i made i don't know not that much money, so right. he, so they 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 let me go. Adam took me out to lunch, and he was like, "I don't really handle any of this stuff. Like, uh, really like you. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I got to think. This guy gave us an ultimatum, and we can't get rid of him. Uh, uh, so. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, a little a little bit. And uh, yeah, I thought I ruined my life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like that giant chance I took. I fucking I destroyed it. Uh, but then. Things work out. It's never as bad as it, as it looks. Right. I got a job at Funny or Die. I was pretty excited about that. It was just like a facilities production job. I was like liaison. To, they were on the Oprah lot, the uh, own lot, mm-hmm. like uh, Formosa and whatever the fuck, two local. Uh, were you ever there when Ben Avery was there? No. Okay. I didn't even know he worked there. I didn't either. He did, when, when I pod, when I podcasted with him, he was like, yeah, I was at Funny or Die for a bit. That's where I learned to drink on a job. Not learn to drink on a job, but he was like, yeah, I drank all day over there. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. I got to chat with him about that. I, <laughs> I will say after after he left Tim, uh, we went out to eat, and he didn't really know what direction he was going to go. I said, start a podcast as fast as you can. Keep the heat. Keep the heat. Right. Uh, I love Lemon Party. Shout out, Ben Avery. Dude, Ben's the best. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, so I okay, got yeah. I, I got a Adam, job there, and the job was like a liaison to the the lot. So if we wanted to shoot on the lot, we had to go like block it off, make sure all that stuff. And it was fun because I got to be in the uh, the producer, the creative producers meetings uh, to help that. And I would throw out ideas. I really felt like it was melding. And then uh, five months in, they laid off a third of their staff, and uh, and I also. There were two facilities people, this other girl, I don't know, she was way – because you also were front desk and managed the interns and stuff. Uh-huh. And I, like – I didn't really know how really corporate jobs worked, how you really just have your department. And so I'm, like, telling everybody right when I start that, like, I want to work in comedy. I want to do this. And, like, a couple weeks in, my department lead, like, brought me in and was, like – it's like super disrespectful that you get this job. And like, I literally didn't understand that that was like, cause like now I watch something like Barstool and there are people who work at Barstool have nothing to do with the content. That is just their place of work. And that's really the kind of job I had, but because it was funny or die, I felt like it was like, I want to write for the funny shit. Yeah. We're all, we're all doing the same thing, but, but 
they weren't. It, you get hired as a producer. That's the role you get. But I was always like trying to backdoor my way in. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so I think because I had showed so much that I wasn't even going to stay at that job, I had no chance of making it through that round of cuts for Funny or Die. Okay. So then once again, I thought my life was ruined. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, this was like uh, January 2018. And so at that time, I just called up Theo uh, because I I was like trying to figure out my finances, kind of figure out my runway, how long I had until I had to find something. And I'm like, oh, like that gig, we 1099 then, what's happening there? And Uh uh, that was like the only reason I called. And then he was like, oh, so what are you doing? I was like, I just got laid off. And he's like, oh, I'm getting a little traction on my podcast. Like I could use some help. And uh, (laughs) yeah, yeah. And uh, right away with him, it was just clips and just t- copied the Gary V timing bar that was like, do you remember that? Like on Instagram? Oh, like but, the little like, yeah, red thing? Yeah. yeah, which I really think helped retention a ton back in the day. Totally. Like people got over it. But uh, some of these clips popped off and I think he like saw that what I thought was funny of his is also what he thought was funny of his, his like we just like lined up and he liked what I picked and uh yeah it just kind of grew from there started having guests in and like I I think like every step of the way I was like going above and beyond like all he said was like our first guest was Jay Moore all he said was we're gonna have a guest in we only had one camera I like borrowed two other cameras and did like a multi-cam setup when he didn't know that was going to be the case and I think like right. every step of the way I went like a little further than he anticipated and it helped out and it grew to like when I started the show was getting like 20,000 YouTube video uh maybe 10,000 audio okay and he had and Theo had 60,000 Instagram followers so now he has <laughs> that's six so million fucking crazy man that's so fucking crazy 60 yeah he, a, a thousand times the the following <laughs> <laughs> that's so wild so so then there's there's more to the story than that. Cause that that was six years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're starting to do clips. It's you're seeing it grow more and more and more, and then it starts evolving where it's you're becoming more involved in other podcasts, mm-hmm. and you're starting to intermingle and join forces. Which which I don't even really know the full story. I know there's kind of weaving in and out in a couple concentric circles, but I don't really know how it works. And I'm sure there's a couple other people that don't either. Mm-hmm. So tell me it's tell me how that goes. Yeah. So uh the I was working on this past weekend with Theo and then um he had been doing it out of his kitchen. He had just moved into this building in Playa Vista. He stole the story a lot, but there was some guy, uh Thomas from um uh uh Eighty Living I can't even remember the pizza place. I've heard this ad 8,000 times. It's saying that I'm drawing a blank. But some guy who owned a pizza shop in Santa Monica was just like, I really think you have it. I'm going to be your first sponsor, but I just want you to promise me that you'll get a studio. And uh, so Theo got a studio. He had just started guesting on Fighter and the Kid. Uh-huh. Uh, and that chemistry was – like he would just go in and like destroy the room and those guys laughed and like right. ev- everybody just loved the vibe. Was this before, after, or during – that string of Rogan appearances where that really uh, popped him off. It was it was kind of right around the same time. Okay. He had like one Rogan when I was still working at Adam Carolla that like did well and has like grown since then. But like people, did, it was kind of his second one that like really popped. Right. And so like right around that time, he was doing all these Fighter and the Kid appearances and those did really well. And he did Hot Ones right around the time. There was just all these hits that like – you oh, could yeah. you could literally see the there leap. was the there was a year of Theo mm-hmm. where he's just saturated in everything and crushing on mm-hmm. everything that he's on. And uh, kudos to him, really smart. Like he, at one point, was like, "This helped me being on every pod, and just crushing." But then at some point, you you dial it back, and you don't want to be on everything all the time. Like when you reach a certain level, and I think it was really. Uh, a lot of foresight by him because, like, totally. I'm just kind of like, go, go. I'm like, no, do it. Get in front of Mike. Like, but right. he 100% right on that. Um, uh, and then, so yeah, he starts going on Fighter and the Kid. And then Brian Callen uh, was on uh, Schooled or some network show or something. He was the lead in some network show. Oh, right. Like Goldberg's. Goldberg's, but then, then they had the a spin off. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Uh, so he was shooting that. So he was missing Fighter and the Kid a lot. 
Oh, and the studio uh, Theo moved into was in Playa Vista. It was the same building as Fighter and the Kid. It was like a WeWork type build- building okay. in Playa Vista. And Fighter and the Kid moved from a small one to a bigger one. And Theo just took their old small one uh, in this building. Um that wasn't like set for podcasts at all. It was just like a shared office space that you could rent out. Right. And um, crazy to set up a podcast studio. In there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. It was. It, it was. Like not, you guys have a key to a door that no one else can get into. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, and it was nice. Like they had like a uh, front desk and stuff, so it gave like this professional vibe. Like when guests would come and stuff, uh, which I don't know. It just always made me feel better instead of, you know, like just having them show up when they don't know your sh- show is big and then they're showing up someplace. I like having like a little front desk and amenities, oh, totally. amenities and stuff. Um, so Brian is filming that show. So Theo starts like bas- guest hosting recurringly there and they're right down the hallway from each other. And then their chemistry was so good that they just decided to do a podcast. And then that was always like, anytime these kind of combinations would get together, that would be the comments, you know, these guys need a podcast. These guys need a podcast. It's always, it's <laughs> so funny how that's always the main thing where it's just like, not everyone needs a fucking <laughs> forever podcast together. Yeah. It's always the top. These two need it. This is the show. <laughs> it's like, no, nah, it was a good episode. They'll and be the, back. <laughs> and, and they live in different cities. And right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, There's so many things that will not make this regular. <laughs> yeah. And I think that one of the things that did make it is just that those guys were showing up at the same studio. So it made right. it very it was e- proximity. Yeah. It yeah. made it very easy to do. And uh, so they started King and the Sting. We shot two episodes at that place, but then uh, they like wanted to beef it up a little bit and hired a production company, Malka, uh-huh. and they did like- the I know Malka. F- yeah. They're not around anymore, are they? Uh, no, but Lewis is. Lewis is a great okay. guy who started Malka, um, and he's still uh, he's still producing, involved in pods. Uh, they started- uh, uh, Jewish dude? Like yeah, really Jewish? Yeah. Uh, I'll say Jewish. I, okay. I I am not Jewish, so I'm not gonna. All right. uh, no, it's just, uh, a, it's just a Hebrew him. word for yeah. that thing. I'm just like it always. Whenever I heard someone working, they're like, "Who the f- what Jew is fucking <laughs> running that place?" And I'm sure you're great. I'm sure you're great. <laughs> he, he, he is. I, I really I really like him, and uh, he's someone I've like. I don't know. Ask questions to and stuff. He he's a really good guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but they did like the first forty episodes, at, but they were they were charging more than necessary. Uh, they did look overheads a real bitch when it comes to podcasts. If you want them to look nice, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, a real bitch. A hundred percent. Um, and they were very like it was it was a fat like they got it done, got it out on time and stuff. But I do think it was like more than the show needed, and that was kind of always the discussion. So around episode fifty, end of twenty nineteen, we brought it in house, and we uh, ended up going to Theo's new studio that we moved out to in Encino. And uh, we already had this this past weekend, one there, and then we uh, set up the King of the Sting set, and we started filming there. And, uh, like, the show was already doing well, but, like, I'd say, like, the f- six months in the lead-up to COVID is when it really popped off. And, like— Dude, COVID was—I hate to say it. What a magical time. <laughs> what a magical time for podcasts. <laughs> I, I've, said it, I've said it before, and I'm really sorry for— any of the bad, lost your job, lost family. Right. 2020 was the best year of my life. <laughs> <laughs> there is. I feel so guilty about uh, thinking that too, dude. It was, it was really was it, just pure insanity. It, you were the, we were the only game in. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, I, at the, like, I was living, I was living fine before, like as Theo's pot started to grow, but I would say that year with the two shows, that's when I finally like had money in my pocket and I could like, afford to go do stuff like which is ironic because you couldn't do stuff but uh like i just had money in my pocket and the shows were going great i don't know it was a it was a great year it was a great Hell year yeah. um and that yeah king of the sting was so fun we did just a lot of so tell me how that like so once king and the sting once they decided because i'll tell you how like the 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 mentality of how two bears started and then how that kind of like like I'm sure there's a shit ton of similarities, mm. but you start hearing like the the idea getting kicked around. Like, is it? Hey, so I think uh, I think we're gonna start a podcast with Brendan. Um, is that something you're into? Mm-hmm. Was it like one of those situations, or was it like we're gonna start doing two episodes a week? One of them's this, one of them's this. Need you to show up. Like, how? What does that conversation look like? It was the former. It was mm-hmm. like you think this is a good idea. Um, I it, Theo like had like it, and. 
I I have his same opinion of myself, but like he, he trusts my opinion, and like right away I was like, why do you trust my opinion? You don't. But it was just like a feeling he had about me. Like I think the same things, but I'm like, what evidence do you have that? But he will like he'll ask me my opinion on stuff, and yeah. uh, I thought that was a great idea. Like there was like an undeniable chemistry between Brendan and Theo. Like some of those early Fighter and the Kid episodes are just just classics. Like yeah, and Theo just going in there and cracking them up and roasting each other and stuff. And it, it made the most sense. Totally. Yeah. To, for them to start. And we just did. And then we said, we want like, this is when everybody starts having a podcast and Rogan, everybody went on Rogan. He'd be like, you need a podcast. And like, right. it started to become cliche. Everybody's got a podcast. So we wanted to format it a little bit different. And so that's why we did all like fan submissions and it was people sent in videos and they sent topics. Just the smartest shit. Like uh, that's, it's, it's one of the most key forms of having a super loyal fan base. Mm-hmm. You like fan interactions and engagements during the show is they're producing the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But the, the thing is you need to get to a point where you have an audience to have, so, have that. Exactly. Um, and because they're not all going to be banger submissions. Yes. So you get a big, a bigger sample size. Sure. It'll take a while to get through all the emails, but you know, no matter what one, one week's worth of emails, you will find a show's worth of stuff to, to have on. Ab- absolutely. And, uh, it was like, there's just some really fucking funny fans out there. Like it, they, they gave great content and, uh, it was just a little different than what's out there. And it, it did well. And, we just try to sometimes do unique stuff like on their on uh, Brennan and Theo's birthdays are like two days apart. And I'd say maybe like a month into or it was March 20th. So lockdown must have just happened unless it was this was 2021. Either way, it's COVID. I wanted to get a barbershop quartet in and I, uh-huh. I, I, I start uh, I start emailing. I talked to one guy. He's like. Oh uh, yeah, we could maybe do it. Uh, one guy, and this was Monday night, the day before we record on a Tuesday. And he's like, uh, "Everybody's in town except this one guy's in Vegas." He's like, "Let me call him." This guy drove from Vegas that night, and they showed up for like fifteen hundred dollars, and they they sang a custom uh, big butt song about Theo and sang them happy birthday, and it was it was just <laughs> magical. I don't know, it, it really got a kick out of it. <laughs> it's just stuff that entertains me, and I just thought that was really, really funny to have a barbershop quartet that assembled after COVID. And yeah, a, absolutely, dude. It's fourteen people in a room. <laughs> the beginning of all that shit, and and that's what's the most fun of like being in that seat of a podcast where it's like. Normally in traditional entertainment, like you can't just throw ideas at someone and expect it to get to the person that says yes, or literally not even pitch it to anyone. I just right, did, I just like did people it. will tell you, like, hey, you want to shut the fuck up and maybe just do your fucking job and like do the data entry that we're asking <laughs> you to do. But like there'd be times where it's uh, 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 where I think it was maybe a live show or maybe it was just some of the first two bear shows where it was just like. Yeah, hey, let's just fucking tempt Bert and just keep on bringing food out. Like, it's, <laughs> like bring a plate of donuts and then bring some burgers and then bring some, like, just let fuck, like, just every form of temptation. And he didn't out. know, and he didn't know, and you just kept putting the food in front of him? Yeah, Tom was the, <laughs> Tom was the only one that was allowed to know what was going on. I mean, he signs the check, so of yeah. course he's going to be able to know what's going mm-hmm. on. But it's, you never surprise Tom. You always surprise the, de- uh, the guests as long as it's like, you know, uh, yeah. the, what the game plan is. Mm-hmm. So I remember when Two Bears started, uh, first it started off with like, we'll do two of these a month. And I think this was like right before COVID. Mm-hmm. So it was like two of these a month. And I think it was when COVID started where they're like, well, fucking, we don't have anything else to do. We might as well take this up to weekly. And then it was interesting. It was interesting because like you have one boss, which is Theo. Mm-hmm. And I had one boss, which was Tom and, you know, and Christina too, for what, whatever it's worth. But it's then the show starts getting really big and it's like, oh, working with some of this talent, like the 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 relationships are a little like muddy now. Like it's I know exactly where I stand with the people that sign my paychecks, but there's some other people like I remember like me and Bert, like we're really friction yet. Really? At the beginning of it, because there was a there. And, and I love Bert. Like Bert is the best hang. Like there's never a moment where I'm in his presence where I'm like. Fuck that guy. Like, uh, and all, like, Bert's the biggest fucking sweetheart. Mm-hmm. And he always just tries to add to a situation and make it fun. 
But I remember what was happening was there was an ongoing bit that Tom and Christina hated me and everything that I did. And like, I was in on the bit yeah. and it was all that. But from Bert's seat, he was like, oh, is this the bit? We just shit on a dove? All right, yeah, let's do that. And it's the same thing where it's just like, I know him shitting on me is a joke. I don't think you're joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're really mean. And it caused some frictions and we butted heads, but then we just squashed it. Like, I think Tom went to go take a shit one episode and we just kind of, started talking about like, hey man, do we have a problem with each other? On air? Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, and it's early on too. It's the first 20 episodes, I think. And- I know what I'll be watching. <laughs> but like after that, it was just like, oh, there's just miscommunication. How dare you? <laughs> like, uh, it, it just ends up being like, oh, there's just miscommunication and there's not a clear definition on how this relationship mm -hmm. works. Did you find, like, what was the situation like when- First, you're just kind of starting to work for Theo, mm -hmm. and then you started doing King and the Sting, where that was you and Chin also joining forces yeah. to do that, right? Yeah. Like, what was that situation like? Chin is incredibly easy to work with. Like, he, there's just, like, no friction from his end. And you guys hadn't worked together before then? <clears throat> we had only, um, we crossed paths a lot because we were both in that building. Right. And, like, I would walk past and he'd be editing all the time. And a couple times, uh, I think I was just, I'd have, like, a 60... 60 hertz buzz that I know it was coming from. I'm like, hey, Chin, can you come help you out? It was kind of like, <sighs> I'm like doing right. my shit, but yeah. I'll, I'll, just grabbing lines and wiggling them. Like, are you hearing it go away? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Dude, I didn't even, I didn't know that XLRs couldn't cross electrical. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I, I promise you every single podcast producer remembers the time when they learned yeah. that. <laughs> What is it? Dude, we have it so much better. I had Toby McMullen in here uh, back when he was producing Are You Garbage? Mm -hmm. Do you know that in New York, they deal with wires picking up radio frequencies? Literally, they have to like put some sort of Faraday's cage in fucking whatever thing they're working in so that frequencies can't come in. But yeah, what was the uh, so you and Chin worked pretty well together? Yeah, yeah. I, th I do think initially Brendan thought I was like just a Theo super fan and really like more in his corner. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that quickly wore off and he saw like I'm really enthusiastic and I'll do whatever. So like he he start, started started. I started to grow on him and now like we're we're really close and like he's super loyal and I'll I'll, I'll I I love Brendan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dude and that's the thing like it's I Brendan gets so much I from the beginning from when it started I was like I don't really get it dude. Mm -hmm. Anytime he's been a guest on anything that I've booked, he's been one of the better guests where yeah. it's like he's He's giving as much as he's getting. Like, it's just he's reacting. Mm -hmm. He's adding to conversations. He's not quiet. Mm -hmm. Never understood it, dude. Never understood it. And it's, and even then, it's, it, it still just continues. And it's like, guys, it's, these aren't terrible takes. Like, <laughs> what the fuck is happening here? And I'm sure, like, you know, if I watched every episode, I'd maybe get it more. But, like, from the outside, I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. Uh, I think he'd say there's like valid criticisms and I think a lot of it is a product of if you add it up, like it's probably 12 hours of broadcasting a week or something. He's got a mic in front of his face. I don't know. That's a long. That's Objectively a, too much. <laughs> Objectively too much. Yeah, Adam Carolla does like 14 hours or something. But it, here's the difference is that he comes from broadcast. There's yeah, a difference yeah, between like Dr. Drew is the same way. Mm -hmm. Like he started off in. Being a doctor where he's at work 16 hours a day, comes home to sleep for fucking six hours and then starts it over. So when he went into radio, like, or whenever we worked with him and we're like, hey, buddy, it's, uh, we got a pretty stacked, like, production schedule for the next two weeks. So would you be able to do, like, like record two episodes today? He goes, yeah, let's do four. I don't give a shit. Yeah. And you're like, what do you mean let's do four? And he's just as good in the fourth episode as he is in the first episode. Like, how are you able to do this? He's like. This is child's play. I'm talking into a microphone. Lives aren't on the line. Mm -hmm. This is easy work. <laughs> like, oh, okay, all right. Uh, yeah, th he is a, a great example. Uh, and yeah, we both we both worked with him because he, him and uh, he did Doctor Drew show over at, at Adam Studio, and they did the Adam and Doctor Drew show. And like you said, that show was like 40 minutes, five days a week. They knocked it out in one night. One evening, they would come. A uh, little break between shows, little get some coffee, knock right. it out again. Uh, I That was like 
one of the coolest like professional things because like Love Line fan and stuff back totally. in the day and being behind the glass for that show. Like absolutely, that's exactly I, what Doctor Drew After Dark was. Yeah. It was just like, holy shit, I'm fucking. We're in the room for Love Line. This yeah, is crazy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it, just nerding out, but it, it was cool. Have you, have you ever asked uh, uh, Doctor Drew a medical question? We're like, hey man, this thing's like going on with my dick. Should I fucking go to the hospital or am I good? Uh. I maybe think, not dick, maybe it, asshole, maybe nipple, whatever. I think I did about the dick one time. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he's, 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 he's very helpful. <laughs> I remember the most shocking thing. There were two things. There were two things of medical advice that I got from Drew that that always stand out in my head. And it was when he learned how much weed I smoke. He's like, "You're gonna start vomiting nonstop very soon. That's a, that's in your future immediately if you don't stop this." I'm like, oh, yeah, for sure. Never happened. And then I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I was waiting. I was like, either you didn't stop and you do vomit, you didn't stop and you don't vomit, or you stop. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You mean being physically addicted? No. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm never physically addicted mm-hmm. to weed. So that was the one thing that I'm like, okay, that's an interesting thing that's always going to be burned in my head. Then the other thing that he told me, I remember I had just gotten a bidet. I was like, real talk, bidets anything bad with this like because sometimes i just fucking sometimes i don't even think i need a shit but i know it's the morning i'm like let me just turn it on and see what happens and you know maybe it'll just tickle something out oh and then he goes you can do that there's nothing wrong with it you will probably uh get a lazy rectum <laughs> i'm like what's that <laughs> he goes your body's gonna forget how to shit <laughs> without the fucking bidet doing it. i'm like whoa crazy Started limiting my bidet use. No such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no such thing as an easy shit. Yeah. You want a clean shit, dude? You go fucking have to wipe for it down the road. <laughs> uh, I lost. Keep keep going. There's something about bidets, but I lost it. <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, I'm about to get away from it. Yeah. But, <laughs> but okay, so it's uh, Brendan is starting to notice that you are now not a super fan, but you're actually like a person to be trusted and actually knows what you're doing, and you're actually contributing to the product. People don't understand how much thought goes into picking promos and what goes into the moments because mm-hmm. it's like if you have a guest on and like the uh, you make a promo for that like hey we have so and so on the show today but the promo is either Tom or Christina or Bert being funny when the guest is on it's like showcase that the guest yeah, is yeah. good yeah. like it's like there's like all the little like nuances you're like no 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 it's if if we're saying so and so is on the show it has to be highlighting how great they are mm-hmm. or how funny they are or how insightful or whatever it's not just uh Oh yeah, yeah. Kevin Smith's on the show. Here's a dick joke from Tom. And it's like, man, <laughs> eh, that's not like it's not conducive to to what we're trying to do. Absolutely. And you learn. You also get like a different perspective if you're doing your own show and cutting clips for it because like. Oh yeah, you want to kill yourself so much more. So yeah, sometimes <laughs> sometimes there'll be this funny moment, but like the talent won't want to put the clip out for whatever reason. And you're like, why, why? But then I, I've had it where I've said something. I'm like, that was objectively like the funniest part of the episode, but for whatever reason, maybe this isn't what we want to showcase to the world. Right. And uh, yeah, you there, there's a science to it for sure. Oh yeah, dude. There's so many times where it's like objectively, this is the funniest moment out of the episode. But the reason for it is because it's wedged into all this context yeah. before it and after it. Mm-hmm. And when you separate that, you're like, I don't know. I feel like we're doing the job of someone that would want to cancel them. So yeah. let's, <laughs> let's go ahead and not make it easy for them. <laughs> exactly. Let's make them have to fucking dig through shit mm-hmm. in order. Like, let's have them like. And at that point, if you're watching a full episode of something, you're already into fan territory, yeah, yeah. and it's like, they're not going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but fucking isolating it for them is fucking hard, you know, except for, like, when Shane got canceled and that one person yeah. went through a couple episodes. But Patreon episodes. Fucking... I didn't even realize that was from a Patreon episode. I'm pretty sure. I, I think they were only Patreon at one point. Or, I, I, I'm pretty sure that episode was a Patreon Correct. Fact you're probably check me right. There. You're probably right. Fact check me. Okay, so you're now uh, 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 you're working with these two comedians. One of them signs your paychecks, but it's still figuring out a way to make everyone happy. Mm-hmm. You're trying to figure out what what is the what is the the easiest path forward for the least amount of friction on every front. Mm-hmm. Where it's it's making both of these guys happy. It's not going to upset this algorithm. Mm-hmm. It's not going to upset this algorithm. Mm-hmm. It's going to do well over here. The fans are going to like it. And it's like, it's all these boxes that you need to check. And then things kind of start turning a little bit. Like COVID happened, mm-hmm. which was crazy. Like 
all these comedians that were L.A. centric are now like, I think I'm going to move to a different part of the country. Mm -hmm. And scary questions start getting asked to you where it's like, I was born and raised in L.A. I thought I was going to I thought I was going to die there. You know, I mean, maybe I still will. Who knows if I'll go back. But like I have some pretty solid roots in Austin now. Mm -hmm. And it's like shifts start happening. Things start happening where it's like, oh, is this going to. Because I know that, like, you know, Theo stopped doing King and the Sting mm -hmm. and he moved over to Nashville. Like, tell me about that chapter. Yeah, so, uh, like, fall 2020, he moved to Nashville. And sometimes we'd double record when he's in town. Sometimes we'd record re remotely. Sometimes we just get a guest in. Really good revolving door of guests. I mean, we just had all the guys who were, like, probably, like DiStefano, Tim Dillon. Um, right. Uh... Uh, Chris D'Elia came in sometimes. Um, it was it was a good uh, group of guest hosts. And, and Theo did really good with solo episodes too, right? Like uh, everything that I saw was like where it was just him. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, and that he was doing this past weekend. That was still going, and he was doing that in Nashville. We hired like session producers there, and I was still doing this past weekend. And then that lasted for, for probably about a year, and then. Uh, then I started. Then I hired someone for this past weekend, because uh, King of the Sting, like it was just taking up more time. We added Patreon. We were doing more episodes and stuff, and so I was just working on that. And also at this time, I had like my own podcast uh, with two other guys. We did like reality TV uh, stuff, like The Bachelor and Below mm -hmm. Deck was really our okay. our, our, our shit. Um, number I started watching that Below Deck's pretty lit, dude. Uh, it, it was <laughs> it was awesome. I was the, I was the number one Below Deck po podcast in the world at one point. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <Number one>. <laughs> <laughs> it was called another below deck podcast they're still going uh pat and dylan a uh, little falling out we eventually parted ways but okay. uh very fun year we had a patreon with like uh that was getting like 10 grand a month um Fuck yeah. yeah and so i was paying rent with that so i was doing that at the time and i really felt like that was growing as well so like i wanted more time to work on my own stuff with more king this thing so like november 2021 Left this past weekend and uh, still doing King of the Sting. Maybe eight months after that, like, the remote stuff's not working. We want, like, more consistency with King and the Sting. So, like, Theo decides to part ways with King and the Sting. And we rebranded the Golden Hour with Eric Griffin and Chris mm -hmm. I'm This is, like, all going faster. But it was, like, sure. a slow transition trickling out, less remotes, less, less showing up. And eventually... Uh, just kind of separated the shows. And so I was, there was a, a four month period maybe where I wasn't working technically for Theo at all. Uh -huh. And, uh, and then with that year, March 20 or from like end of 2021 to beginning of 2022, I, or maybe a year after this, either way, there was like a year span where I was gone and like, some things just hit and like he started just like he leveled up in like 2017 or whatever. You uh -huh. saw the same thing happening, but like to a new plateau right around this time. And honestly, from afar, I was like feeling a little gretful, a little wistful. I was like, fuck, I kind of want to be a part of that. Like we really laid some groundwork. Uh, and then just as I was feeling about that, he like called me up and like was like, uh, would love to have you back. And it just fucking, it just worked out. Funny fuck. how that works. Yeah. Huh? It, it's lit. It's lit. <laughs> like, I really more recent like like there is like mind melt like you know like uh the illusionists who like they'll guess your card and they like blow the room out. I really sure. think some of the people have that and it's like being like you can just feel that. Like just if someone walks in and they're like kind of like you're feeling something. I don't think it's just like woo woo shit. I think it's like you're picking up on temperature, body language, and all these things combined. And I really right. think you can just like read people. And there's something happening where we both at the same time like, let's get the band back together. Fuck <laughs> yeah, dude. So that was that was like two ish years ago, three ish years ago. About a year and a half ago, it was like l last summer. And then this has been like a new era this past weekend because. Uh, now we do road pods all the time uh -huh. and we've probably shot over the last year, I don't know, probably almost two episodes a week, maybe 80 episodes in the year, probably 30 on the road or something, uh, just in different cities, like run and gun, set up in a hotel room, set up in a speakeasy, set up wherever. It's fucking crazy. It, and it, it's, it's so fun. Uh, Zach is uh, the guy that 
uh, I hired when I left and he really quarterbacks the ship now. He's so much more type A and like just ha handling advertisers and stuff. Like I really want to be part of the creative. I know the other stuff's necessary and I understand like the full industry, but like he's so on point and I think we're a really good team. Uh, and then we come out on the road together. You should you should talk to him. He's got uh, interesting. He w he was like local news in Cincinnati, Ohio. Moved out here. He was doing like a producing for some cook cooking show, and now he's working for Theo. And interesting. Um, yeah, moved he, out here meaning uh, L.A. Or, or sorry, L.A. LA. Okay, got it. Yeah, I forgot we were not in L.A. Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he he's great, and I think we're a great team. And we we've just been to Vegas, Palm Beach for Tony Robbins, Miami, uh, Montreal for GSP. Boss, we've been everywhere, and I, I, I haven't traveled like a ton in my life. Like I wasn't on a plane until I was uh, eighteen, and then like in my twenties, oh, really only to and from Wisconsin, and then I've had road trips and shit. But like the last year and a half, getting to see the country has been just fucking awesome. That's crazy. So are you are you guys traveling with like big old Pelican briefcases with equipment, or are you renting it when you get there? Like what is? Uh, it, it, it varies. Sometimes we get a studio. Uh, uh, that, we, that sounds nice. That uh, sounds like the easiest. <laughs> it, it is, but I do like, there's kind of fun with the run and gun setup. And then sometimes we've had like really cool looking locations. There's three different episodes where the place we walked in, you had to open up a bookcase, uh, which I always love, like, like a little speakeasy, like you go in a bookcase and then it was just a cool vibe in there. So I do like setting up the hotel room's really easy. Cause you can get it. There's no in, there's no out. You just get the hotel for the whole time. That's uh -huh. what we're, we're doing in New York. We're doing four episodes from Monday to Wednesday. Damn, uh, I okay. uh, leave tomorrow and that's what we're getting a big suite. Um, to do that, but I don't know. I like both, and I forgot the question. <laughs> uh, just what? Uh, 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 whether you were bringing your equipment? Oh yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, this the the mobile setup we do when we do have to bring everything. Again, fucking incredible job by Zach. It's just a a giant backpack like where you, with the Velcro and stuff, and you kind of arrange it how you want. Right. And he has this system like in the backpack itself. It's all. All three cameras, all the cords, all the everything, and then one giant uh, uh, checked bag that fits that maximum. That's how we, we fit mic arms or cords or everything, and it's Damn. those two things, and we're mobile. And then a, a light kit, too, that, that's its own carry-on thing, but sometimes we'll get lights from wherever city we're in. Interesting. And and now there's like different places like Miami. We have a great equipment guy, in incredibly cheap. If you ever go to Miami, let me know. Like this guy will hook it up. And okay, good to know. Uh, there's a couple cities like that where Is we his have name people. Dom. No. Okay. No different guy. <laughs> <laughs> um. Fucking a man. Okay. So it's like, and it's so interesting because the longer you are in podcasting, the more you see it evolve and you're just in different eras of seeing how everything goes. Mm -hmm. And like it's and it really is wild. And I know that we were going to go back and talk a little bit about uh, 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 first it was King and the Sting mm -hmm. and then Two Bears kind of superseded it. And now like Bad Friends is just on top mm -hmm. of everything like it's just so interesting to see everything evolve and trying to analyze why things kind of diffuse, why things like take one over the other. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Like it's the, and I mean, really it all boils down to is just like everyone evolves, mm -hmm. right? Like everyone changes. Like I'm a different person than I was 10 years ago, five years ago, yesterday. Like I'm, I'm constantly changing and there's, it's the people like it's the 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 hosts that have always just like keep it in their head like well a first we this isn't a burden like that we love doing this and we show up every day like we love it like it's not a job mm -hmm. but it's that always coming in with the fun and the reason why people always watched your podcast making sure that that reason never leaves mm -hmm. and really that's the recipe like it's first it's hard to fucking get that ignition of like oh they love it but to keep them staying is like, make sure that the reason they love it is always going to be there. Mm -hmm. Cause really that's whenever I see podcasts fall off is just that, that spark. But I wanted to ask you because mm -hmm. this past weekend has gone on a tear. Like I've like the last two years, just the, the, the caliber of guests, the caliber of just everything feels like it's gone up. What is it like? Like 
Because I've been times where we book comedians where I'm like, holy shit, Bill Burr, I can't believe it. I'm pinching my – Al Franken, this is crazy. <laughs> You're in a room with fucking Donald Trump fucking crazy fucking podcasts. Like, Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> like you literally – like anyone that was political during this election season, you guys had on the yeah. show, which is crazy. Yeah. Like what is, what is it like for you when you're when you're setting that up and – like what? What is that situation? It's funny because, like you know, like I don't know. Right when I first started, there could be some guy from NCIS that came in, and I'd be like, "Oh my god, that guy's on TV!" Right, and that goes away really, really fast. And mm -hmm. then, like the ones that kind of like move the needle get fewer and far between. But like, uh, absolutely, me meeting Norm Macdonald, that was the biggest one ever. Brief inter brief interaction with them. That was awesome. But then they just start to wane and they, it does just like, it's another job. It's another Right. Person. You realize that ah, they're all just people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And they're still your fate. Like I was really excited for our Bill Burr this past weekend episode, right. which uh infamous episode. Right. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, those Bostonians, man, people, it's yeah. a little fire in that belly. And some, <laughs> and something with like absurdist humor and, and, and Bostonians, like, oh, totally. Like Dave Portnoy, like when you try to get silly with them, it's kind of the same reaction. He's like, yeah. what the fuck are we talking about? Like, like just, <laughs> fuck, what, whatever game you're playing, I don't want to play it. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, I forgot again. Moving the needle of like yeah, yeah. having pinch me moments with, with guests. And so that like really for the most part went away. It was rare where I was like really excited. But the, like you said, the the guests, like those are ones you're you're just excited for and like, oh, I hope we get a picture. Like I hope someone right. I hope someone suggests that like afterwards. And I don't know, it's it's cool, it's surreal surreal. I mean, it's literally not Absurd to say that these podcasts swayed the election. Absolutely, and, they and did. to be like a small part of that is really, really surreal. Yeah, and did I, I want to look back at those emails they sent to these podcast companies. Like, I, <laughs> I, I was like, I did like the industry. I think it's going to be like it's just the infancy, infancy. It's the way people want to communicate. Like, and uh, here we are, dude. It's fucking crazy, man. It's. And I always feel so lucky, you know, like it's it's one of those things where it's uh I feel lucky for ha for making the decisions that I did all those years ago that leads you to this thing cuz mm -hmm. like you're just going one foot in front of the other the entire time. And then all of a sudden you realize you're like Yo, these are some real nice lights. That's a real crazy camera. Like, this is fucking, this is a nice microphone. Like, that. how the fuck did I get here? Mm -hmm. And it's not just one big decision that you accidentally fell back into. Mm -hmm. It's a series of decisions that just, you had that fire in your belly. Mm -hmm. And you knew how to, like, get into the places that you wanted to do. And all through just trying. Mm -hmm. And, like, most people don't understand that you got to, there's really like a couple things that that you need to have in order to do well, not just in this business, in any business. Mm -hmm. It's showing up. Mm -hmm. Showing up is more than half of it, but showing up and ready to be hungry. Like you need to be hungry and you need to care. Do, uh, do you know uh, John Wooden, uh, anything about him? He was the UCLA basketball coach for like 50 years, the Wizard of Westwood. Uh, he he – passed away a couple years ago but he's just legendary basketball coach uh like grew up on a farm like 1900s he was married to his wife for 80 years uh just absolute legend um he had this like path for living that i heard in like a tony robbins interview in like 2011 with john wooden and it's like one of the most impactful podcasts for me but like he created this path for life and he calls it the pyramid of success and there's all these traits within it and the top is uh, competitive greatness, but the cornerstones are industriousness and enthusiasm. And if you work hard and you love what you do, you will be a success at whatever it is. There'll be varying degrees of it, but if you do those two things, absolutely, you'll be a success. Honestly, that's that's great advice. One thing that I like to do whenever I have you know guests like you on that are in the industry, and there's people that are always on the outside looking in, is what is the one biggest piece of advice? Like, let's say there's someone that listens to, to uh, uh, podcasts while they're doing their mechanic job or, you know, they, they, they work at a FedEx or they're a UPS driver and, and not knocking that's a bad job, but let's say that this is something that they want to get into. 
what is step one that you would say for them to do that? Just go towards your the area, like put yourself in a position to be around it. Like how I got the doorman jobs at the comedy club. Like that was just a start to like, I knew I wanted to be by comedy. I had no resume. That's that's where you start. That did that didn't necessarily lead to anything. But it is funny. There was a, a a fellow doorman who eventually managed the club, who we were buddies. And then years later, we reconnect when we were booking Jordan Peterson. And this guy's now Jordan Peterson's guy, and I was Theo's guy. So also like grow contacts. That's another th- industry. So small, totally. you see these people along the way. When I was living in my car. One of the guys, like I messaged LinkedIn. Oh, LinkedIn Premium is a good one too. You can uh, in-mail people uh, like 30 bucks a month and you can basically email anyone you want because it just right. goes directly to their inbox. That was the thing I've used a lot for various different things. But I emailed this guy, Mike Jensen, uh, who uh, worked at iHeart at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, I want to work in podcasting. I just love to pick your brain. And he went and got cof- coffee with me in Playa Vista. And I'm living in my car, didn't have the job. He was super nice, like kind of told me some places I should like keep kicking tires. And then like six years later, I'm on an email with him and he's the ad guy as I'm producing for Theo. And he was like, holy shit, you're the kid that I took out for coffee. And uh, yeah, so knock on doors, put yourself around whatever it is, like, and always try... I don't like as long as you're going towards it, you may like divert, but you're still closer than you were when you started and you have this like paralysis by analysis and you don't do anything like just go towards it. Uh, Middle school football coach, Mr. Service said, if uh, you're going to make it a mistake, make it at full speed, Nicky Baki, full speed. (laughs) (laughs) So don't worry about making mistakes. Just go forward and put yourself around the things you like. If you just do it, that's how you learn learn to podcast. I would also say that to anybody who wants to start a podcast, there's no downside. Listenership is not the goal. It's like you're doing something. Oftentimes you'll be doing it with like friends of yours that you like. You're definitely learning a skill that can help you. And there's a million aspects that apply to other jobs. And like, right. like I'm sure you use like AI occasionally for shit. And like, It's just stuff like that. You get more comfortable and there's a million applications that you can use other places. This is also my other very favorite, favorite thing that I've ever heard. And it's a failure is only a failure if you don't learn from it. If you don't learn from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're like not a (laughs) European shit, but like, yeah, don't make the same mistake twice. And if you did something and you fell flat on your face, figure out what the thing was that made you trip. Mm -hmm. And how do you prevent yourself from tripping on the next one? That's so fucking valuable. Watch There's, a game tape. So yeah. You're, <laughs> you're, you're figuring out 999 ways to not make a light bulb, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you just learned another way not to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and with that, dude, I want to say thank you for coming on here. Uh, is there anything you'd like to plug or promote? Yeah, check out the After Hour podcast. It's kind of like a behind-the-scenes show that I do with uh, Chin and a couple other guys that work at uh, Thick Boy Studios. And then also... Uh, on my YouTube channel, another MMA podcast. I usually I've been live streaming pretty consistently all all the fights, and uh, we gamble, occasionally drink, occasionally smoke, and we have a great time watching the fights. Dude, I might need to zoom into one of those. Yeah, I like to drink and smoke and gamble, so uh, I might. Uh, <laughs> let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> I'm fucking down, dude. <laughs> there's uh, we Nadav and I both love gambling. I don't think there's any. I can under I don't I can understand why people love horse racing because like. Like a fight, it's a fifteen-minute segment. Your your bets on the line, and I think it's the best gambling experience there is. Oh on yeah, a fight. dude! <laughs> like it, I've used gambling to get myself into sports that I want to like, just don't like. Yeah, like, yeah. Force yourself. It's a <laughs> it's a good mechanism, guys. Gambling. If you're not gambling, you're not living. <laughs> if there's any takeaway from this entire podcast, it's that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with that, dude, thank you for coming on. I appreciate you uh, doing this, taking the time. Uh, I'm so glad we were able to link up while you're in Austin. Yeah, and, thanks for uh, having me. And most importantly, everyone at home, remember that everything you just heard is totally unconfirmed news. <laughs> See you next week.